Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Glad, Chief Medical Officer of Fullscript, the leading healthcare platform for providers to prescribe healthcare's best supplements, drive better patient outcomes, and scale practice growth with unparalleled efficiency. As a healthcare provider, I know that finding time to stay up to date on the latest trends and research in modern medicine can be a daunting task. That's why I'm excited to share a cutting edge supplement course our team of medical experts worked on in collaboration with A4M and several industry experts designed to help you navigate supplements and make more informed clinical decisions. Throughout the 16 hours of content, we'll give you the clinical context you'll need to confidently recommend supplements to your patients. The A4M Supplement Certification course is the perfect starting point or clinical update for optimizing your supplement treatment plans to ensure the best possible outcomes for your patients. Go to www.a4m.com slash supplement dash certification dash course dot html and use the promo code podcast20 at checkout to get a 20% discount. Enroll today and elevate your whole person care. Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our host for Redefining Medicine is Dr. Erica Schwartz. For more than 20 years, Dr. Erica has been at the forefront of advanced patient care, taking the best from conventional and integrative medicine and applying them to prevent disease. Dr. Erica is a distinguished A4M faculty member in disciplines ranging from hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and IV nutritional support. We're here in South Beach at A4M's BHRT track, and we have the honor and the pleasure of having Dr. Mohit Kera, who is a urologist at Baylor, but he's also the leader in testosterone these days. So uh, we want to listen to everything he has to say because it'll change the way you practice medicine and the way you help your patients with the use of testosterone. Dr. Kara, thank you so much for joining us. Thank I'm you. so thrilled. Thank you. Um, tell me about testosterone. <laughs> well, there's so many exciting things that have been going on with testosterone really lately, and I think the most exciting is the TRAVERSE trial. You know, uh, in the context of a story for many years, we used to think that testosterone may increase cardiovascular risk. And in 2015, the FDA said, let's do a study. Let's do a large randomized placebo-controlled trial. So this study was called the TRAVERSE trial. Uh, the first patient was enrolled in 2018, last patient was enrolled in 2022. Over 5,200 men randomized to testosterone or placebo, and these men received a testosterone gel. And what did they find? There was no increased risk in cardiovascular risk uh, in men receiving testosterone over uh, placebo. Now remember, these men were already at high risk. In order to be in this trial, you had to have pre-existing cardiovascular disease or be at high risk for cardiovascular disease. And again, we saw no increased risk. There are many other benefits from this trial. We had many secondary endpoints I'll share with you today. There Please was no do. increased risk in prostate cancer, no increased risk in high-grade prostate cancer, no increased risk in urinary symptoms, which was very encouraging. Uh, we did see that there was an improvement in anemia in those men who suffer from anemia. Uh, we did not see any improvement in, bone, uh, in, in, in fracture data. In fact, some of the men who took testosterone had a slight increased risk in fracture. And we didn't see any improvement in diabetes. Now, this is contrary to other studies, so it was right. a little different. Um, but we did see a slight improvement in depression, and we did see a, a slight improvement in libido as well. How old was the group? Great question. So if you remember the T trials a long ago, this was, right. it came out in 2016. That trial was only in older men right. over the age of 65. Right. And those were 790 men. In this trial, we took men between the ages of 45 and 80. So they're much younger Broad. and older. And if you look at the breakdown, roughly half the men were above the age of 65 and half the men were below the age of 60. Below. So nice um, That's a very demographics. Good cross section, yes, right? yes. Um, but they all had pre existing. Cardiac Pre-existing, or they had cardiovascular, uh, either they had surgery. Yeah, so cerebrovascular disease, 
peripheral vascular disease or cardiovascular disease. So they had to have pre, uh, or they had to have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, meaning hypertension, age over 65, uh, increased coronary calcium score. Um, so either had risk factors or they had pre-existing. So we took patients who were at the highest risk for getting a heart attack, and yet it didn't show that they increased the risk of a heart attack when they took testosterone. Which is wonderful. Yeah. Let's talk about the method of administration. Yes, so in this trial, we use gel. And so some have asked, can you translate this method to other methods? Mm -hmm. Because some have said, well, if someone's on an injectable, can this be very similar? Now, I think as a class, yes, uh, you can say that, but the injectables behave a little bit differently. Right. Injectables have a higher rate of erythrocytosis. There's a higher uh, peak and trough, and they tend to have higher levels. So I think, you know, with some caution, um, you have to be careful in translating to the injectables. So what do you recommend? Well, I think that the first step is that we know that testosterone, at, in, through the Traverse trial, at the levels we had, did not increase the risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, I personally don't believe that testosterone increases cardiovascular disease. The data is very strong. There's no debate that men with low testosterone levels are much more likely to have a cardiovascular event, Correct. right? So that's important. Yes. So if you told me that men with low testosterone levels are much more likely to have a cardiovascular event, that gets my attention. Now the question is, if I give you testosterone, does that increase your cardiovascular risk? I don't believe it does. And I believe the Traverse trial helps support that. Right, so I was thinking in terms of the 2007 review of Morgenthaler's review of all the studies, because I'll go now switch to prostate cancer. Yes. <clears throat> where he proved without any doubt that the 1939 Huggins yes. was just a patient. Yes. And that testosterone does not increase the risk of uh, prostate cancer. Yes. So take it so, from there, please. Yeah, so A. Morgenthaler pioneered this entire road and right. really showed us the way. Uh, 1941, Huggins and Hodges uh, said that testosterone increases the risk for prostate cancer. If you pull the article, it's based on one patient. One patient. One patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it wasn't until Dr. Morgenthaler many years showed through numerous studies that testosterone does not increase the risk right. of prostate cancer. We are now in an era where we're starting to use testosterone to treat men with metastatic prostate cancer. So I want you to think about that. If you have metastatic prostate cancer and you walked into Johns Hopkins on a clinical trial, how would they treat you? High doses of testosterone. Right? So think about that. And in those trials, what they showed was uh, the first one that came out in 2015, 50% reduction in PSA, 50% reduction in metastatic disease, giving these men high doses of testosterone. So I think the times are changing. Now look, the AUA guidelines, uh, something amazing happened in 2018. They said, look, testosterone does not cause prostate cancer, strong recommendation. And I was very happy when they published that because many patients used to come to me and say, I Googled it and I heard testosterone causes prostate cancer. I said, no, you have not read the guidelines, no increased risk. But the guidelines do say that we are, need more studies in men with a history of prostate cancer if you give them testosterone. But I think the story about testosterone causing prostate cancer is old. And I think that the Traverse trial also showed no increased risk in prostate cancer, no increase in high-grade prostate cancer, and no worsening of urinary symptoms. And unfortunately, you still have urologists, and I practice in New York City, yeah. um, who will say you cannot take testosterone, even though your testosterone levels, your free testosterone's in the gutter, yeah. and you feel horrible because of the risk of prostate cancer. So yeah, we what do, do you say to those yeah, urologists? So we do something kind of silly in the in, in way we treat these patients. If you have, for example, uh, two twin brothers, twin brother A, twin brother B. Mm -hmm. They both had a radical prostatectomy because they had high-grade prostate cancer. They both walk into my office, and twin brother A has a very low testosterone level, and he feels lousy, mm -hmm. and he says, I really would like to have testosterone. And I say, absolutely not. If I give you testosterone, your cancer's gonna come back. I'm not gonna give it to you. His twin brother B walks in, and he has a normal testosterone of 600, and he feels great. Twin brother A is gonna look at me and say, if having a normal testosterone is bad, then you should castrate my brother. Mm -hmm. Why are you leaving him at 600? Mm -hmm. But that's what we do. We leave the 600 at 600, and we leave the low, low. You have to decide. If it's dangerous, let's castrate everybody. If it's not dangerous, <laughs> that sounds then, awful. well, I'm just saying. That sounds you awful. You have to choose. You, if it's not dangerous, then what is the harm of bringing that patient back into the normal range? Right. So you have to decide. Yeah. And we do decide. In our practice, we've been 
practicing. We've been giving people testosterone yeah. for a long time. And in, about 15 years ago, Morgan Tyler used to send the patients from Harvard over to New York wow. because we wouldn't say we're going to do biopsies because they wouldn't let him yeah. Yeah. treat them. That's right. So talk about that for a second. Well, it's a big paradigm shift. He really <clears throat> was in an era where he had to push really push the envelope. Right yeah. now it's a lot easier. But back then when he started, when Dr. Morgenthal was giving testosterone to these patients, patients, people thought he was crazy. They said, what are you doing? You're gonna cause prostate cancer. Right. And so what he had to do was before he'd treat them, he'd biopsy them right. to show. Well, that was the requirement. That's <laughs> what they required. to show that, yeah. that, that they didn't have cancer. I mean, we would never do that today. Um, but what he did show was that 15% of men who had normal PSAs actually had occult prostate cancer. That was a very interesting find. That was in the, put it in New England Journal of Medicine, big paper yeah. on his part. But the time, the paradigm has shifted uh, from a time when we thought it was dangerous uh, to maybe it may be uh, now protective or maybe even therapeutic uh, for prostate cancer. Talk to me about polycythemia. Right, so there is a concern that testosterone will increase uh, the hematocrit, which it can, and that that increase in hematocrit can cause an increase in cardiovascular risk. Now, there's a big difference between primary and secondary polycythemia. Primary polycythemia, such as from polycythemia vera, from uh, malignancies, yes, there is good data to support that when those patients with those primary polycythemia increase their hematocrit, they can have an increased cardiovascular event. There's been only one study which came out last year, but besides that one study, there was never a study to show that secondary polycythemia increases cardiovascular risk. Meaning if you and I go move to Colorado and our hematocrit goes up, we're not at a greater risk of having a heart attack than someone who's living in Houston, right? Uh, and the same was with testosterone. We start testosterone, our hematocrit goes up, we're not at a greater risk of having a heart attack. There was one retrospective study that came out of the University of Miami last year showing a 1% difference. But again, to me, that's more studies need to be done. So again, I'm not so concerned about the secondary polycythemia. So the polycythemia, I couldn't agree with you more, yeah. but um, the polycythemia really comes from people who are receiving injectable primarily. Right. So it's the method of administration. It, you nailed it. it. So this is important. So the method will dictate the rate. The highest rate is with the injectable. We published showing roughly 66% of injectable. For example, if you give a, uh, let's say a pellet, roughly 35%, you drop the rate of injectable. If you give a gel, you can drop it down to 12%. This was in our, our trial. But if you look at some of the new oral, the oral drop it down to even 5%. So one of the best things you can do if a man has recurrent polycythemia is to switch the mode of, tra uh, of right. treatment. You can go for, if you go from an injectable down to a, a, a oral, you drop it down from 66% down to 5%. Now don't forget, many of these patients have occult sleep apnea. Yeah. You have to send them for a sleep study if they keep getting erythrocytosis because that's one of the best ways to catch it. Right. If they don't want to, uh, if they don't want to switch the mode, some people say, "I like my inje injection. I don't want to switch." Mm -hmm. I say, "Okay, true." Sure. Then you're going to have to donate blood. Right? Either you can right. decrease the dose, which they don't want to do. You can stop, they don't want to do. Or we have them donate a pint of blood separated by one week apart. You said oral. So you didn't say oral testosterone, obviously. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on the oral? Yeah, let's talk about it. Very exciting time for oral testosterone. So for many years, oral testosterone was invented in 1935. Rusica invented it. The problem is that he had to methylate it because it would go past the liver and it get metabolized. Mm -hmm. But when he methylated it, the problem is that that caused hepatotoxicity and liver cancer. Oof. But it was around till the 1970s. In the 1970s, the first testosterone oral undecanoate came out called Andriol. And Andriol was very popular, still available today. It's available in Canada, all over Asia, but it never got passed into the US. Never made it through, so everyone was taking it. Now the problem is, is it has to be taken with a fatty meal, and Andrew had to be taken three to four times a day. So fatty meal three to four times a day, right? But if you mm -hmm. didn't take it with a meal, then mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't get absorbed. Mm -hmm. So these are undecanoate, it bypasses the liver, goes into the lymphatics, but you gotta take it with a fatty meal. Well, something amazing happened in 2019. In 2019, the, F the US got its first oral undecanoate, right? So that's called Jatento, first one that came out. In 2022, the two more oral, uh, to undecanoate testosterone came out, Talando and Kaisatrex. So now in the US, we have three oral testosterones that people can use, and you only have to take it twice a day, which is better than three to four times a day, and it doesn't have to be a fatty meal, but it just has to be a meal, right? 
So um, many patients, you know, if you're intermittent fasting, it makes it a little tricky. Mm -hmm. But if you're not intermittent fasting, twice a day, um, and they work very well. Yeah, how well, I was going to say, do they work? They work really well. So oral testosterone does work very well, but the only thing is you have to make sure in compliance. If someone has to take something once a day, it's a little bit easier than taking it twice a day. And so, uh, but I've found that most of my patients do are pretty good with compliance with the testosterone. They feel better when they take it. So that's more of an impetus to take it. Yeah. Um, and they're more motivated. But again, we you need to take it twice a day. That's an interesting thing. Talk to me for a few minutes about um, the differences in the injectable, you know, the nanthate, yes. propionate, cypionate. Yeah. So what we it's basically on half-life. Now, enanthate and cypionate are essentially the same. Right. Propionate's half-life is much shorter, so it's much more frequently dosed. So I typically prefer to use enanthate and a cypionate. Now, the way I teach the residents is this. I say enanthate has an E, think elderly, mm -hmm. right? Cypionate has a C, think child or younger. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And the cutoff is about 50-ish, 50 to 60. Because if someone is, has a cypionate, it's much more anabolic, slightly longer half-life, and more sodium retention. So it'll get more edema. So if you give a 75-year-old higher doses of cypionate, mm -hmm. he's gonna have some edema, some swelling. So the younger guys will like it, but if he's older, I give an anthate. If he's younger, I'll use cypionate. Do you combine them? I don't combine them, but a I do. A lot of they, people do. A lot of right. people combine them, but I do find that I prefer subcutaneous, mm -hmm. and I prefer that they inject on Sunday and Thursday, because Why? testosterone. Yeah, because <laughs> Sunday. Why do you like Sunday and Thursday? Because the testosterone peaks in 24 hours. Right. I want you to be your strongest on Monday mm. and on the weekend. Right. Right. So you're right. on Monday. I'm Brilliant. on. And on mm -hmm. Friday, I'm on. Right, right? Brilliant. that's the two days you need. Brilliant. So people like it. Sunday and Thursday, sub Q, uh, uh, 0.25 works fantastic. Do you give them an um, an estrogen with that? Cautious. So when I finished my residency and my fellowship, we were giving men an estrogen all the time, very liberally. Mm -hmm. We said men don't need estrogen; they just need to give them an, a Remedex one milligram a day. Mm -hmm. But we were wrong because men really need estrogen. Every day you gave it to them? We used to give it to them every day. Well, some men would give like every other day, but, but we thought but they didn't really need it. This is in 2006, right? Right, right, right. Men absolutely need estrogen, and uh, sure. we and, and you want to use it very um, discreet, discriminately. You don't want to give someone, shut down their estrogen. You want right. to manage it, right. right? So what we will do is now use 0.25, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, and bring it back into the normal range if it's elevated. But there was a wonderful study by Dr. Finkelstein, and he showed that the sexual benefits and the libido are not the testosterone. It was the conversion from testosterone to estradiol, and right. the estradiol is the magic. And if you're shutting down the estradiol- Well, we know that. Yes, right, right. <laughs> so basically, you don't want to shut down the estrogen. Men need estrogen. I agree 100%. Yeah. Listen, I could go on forever with you <laughs> because we have our practice yes. as half men. Yes. And you, what you're doing is amazing, and I okay. think more urologists should hear it, they should read it, they should stay on top of your work because you're at the forefront of really what men need. Thank you so much. Thank really you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.